Open your Bibles, if you would, to 1 John, and uh, you can flip over to chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2. And we are going to do some, uh, some review here tonight with, um, with our message. We, boy, it must have been months and months and months. I don't even know how long it's been. It's been so long I had to review my notes to figure out where I left off. That's how, that's how bad it is. I, I knew I was, in, I was in 1 John. I just could not remember where in chapter 2. And, and uh, we started talking about a new life in Christ, a new life in Christ. And I'm so thankful for the new life that we have in Christ. I mentioned this morning, uh, all things are passed away. Behold, all things become new, and I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that we aren't um, living the lives we used to live, and we can always live better lives. We can always live better lives, and we all have a lot of room to grow, don't we? And I'm thankful for the the Word of God, which gives us our guide in terms of of how and where we need to grow. And uh, it really begins with this new life that we have in Christ. It's being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed. It's not, uh, it, it's not a, a life that we should take for granted either. This is a spiritual life. This is a, a life that we, can, uh, that we can live and we can be unashamed. Aren't you glad that we can live an unashamed Christian life, you know? And I'm thankful for that. Well, we are in First John chapter 2. We've covered uh, the first six verses, but I want to read those for you because it's going to kind of lay the groundwork for the review that we have to do tonight before we get into part two. So beginning in 1 John chapter 2, it says this in verse 1, My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know that we are in him. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. And I'm going to stop right there, and I want to give you a little review. Last time we were together, I kind of gave you three points. Number one, keeping his commandments. uh, And number two, keeping his word. And number three, keeping his walk. In that order, 1 John 2, 3 to 4, talks about keeping his commandments. Keeping his commandments. Uh, I mentioned to you that that this is not about keeping his commandments to get saved. We're not talking about salvation here. We're talking about fellowship. We're talking about likeness to our Heavenly Father. Uh, There are a lot of people out there who try to tell you, try to Christians, that the way you know somebody is saved is by whether or not they're obedient to what God has said or not. But that's just not true. That's not what the context is saying. In here, in verse 3, it says, We do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. This is all about how we know whether or not we are saved. Now, isn't that interesting? It's not talking about how other people view us. It's talking about us personally. There are a lot of people out there. We call them fruit inspectors. right? I had one professor in Bible college call them fruit flies. <laughs> not fruit inspectors. And there's a lot of people who go out there and they try to examine the fruit other people have in their lives to determine whether or not they are saved. But that is just not so. So first, we talked about that. Second, in, uh, in verse 4, uh, I mentioned to you that if there is a person that says that they have an intimate relationship with God and they do not keep his commandments, they are a liar. Now, you can say that with, uh, with all certainty. If you say that you are in him. If you say that you have a, have a close walk with the Lord and you do not, then you are a liar. A closeness, the closeness that we have with the Lord comes from the love we have, right? In John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. Secondly, we talked about uh, his word. So one, keeping his Commandments, secondly, keeping his word. In 1 John 2, 5, But whoso keepeth his word in him, 
Verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. H.A. Ironside, Harry Ironside said this, the word is the expression of the will of God either given in direct commandment or otherwise. So instead, the word here, this word, there are, there are uh, inside the word, there are these commandments. There are commandments in the word of God. And oftentimes we overlook those commandments. We might read his word, but we miss the commandments that he has uh, given to us. And we have to be very, very careful of that. We have to keep his word. I mentioned to you John 14, verse uh, 23, where it says, Jesus answered and said unto him, If any man love me, he will keep my words. He will keep my words. What about these words will he keep? He will keep the commandments contained in the word. So we looked at keeping his commandments. We looked at uh, keeping his word. And then we looked at keeping his walk. And this is very, very powerful. This is one of the hardest things for me as a, as a pastor and as a Christian. Listen to this. First John 2, 6. He that saith, he abideth in him. If you say that you abide in Christ, watch this. Uh, in him ought himself also so to walk even as he walks. So if you say you abide in Christ, if you say you abide in him, you ought to walk even as he walked. Now that is heavy. How many of us in this room can say, I walk just as the Lord walked? I do exactly what the Lord does. You know, we have those, uh, those uh, what would Jesus do bracelets that, that people wore with a, with a lot of pride, and what would Jesus do? Well, here's a great example. What would Jesus do? And I gave you four things that we can look at, the way that Jesus walked, that God has asked us to walk in tandem with him. I mentioned number one in service, John 13, verse 14. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you ought also to wash one another's feet. How many of you can say that you serve others the way that God served others? That's, that's heavy. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also should to walk even as he walks. So if he's out washing feet, guess what? You ought to be serving too. And, and, and I think that is a, 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 an anomaly in the Christian life, unfortunately. It shouldn't be, but it is. How many of us can say that we actually go out and we look for opportunities to serve? I think the Lord looked for opportunities to serve. I don't think he just served because it was, oh, look at that, oh, there's, there's it is right there. I mean, I think he had his eyes wide open, and he looked at the needs of other people, and he said, there right there is someone that I can serve. So are you walking as Jesus walked? Are you serving? I mentioned sacrificing. First uh, John three sixteen. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren? Are you sacrificing for the brethren? It's amazing that service and sacrifice often go together. They're often a thread that weaves together a wonderful tapestry. And you look at that, you say, man, there is service and there is sacrifice. I mean, what sacrifice, or what service would it be, rather, if there was no sacrifice tied to it, you know? It's amazing when you see somebody out there and they are sacrificing themselves to serve others. That is walking as Christ walked. He sacrificed. He laid down a tremendous amount to help other people, and we ought to do the same. I mentioned suffering, 1 Peter 4, 12 through 13. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing has happened unto you. But rejoice in so much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings. Wow. That's amazing. Have you ever thought about being a partaker of Christ's suffering? Are you suffering for the Lord's sake? Now, obviously, we look back into, into history and we see all of these Christian martyrs that, that, that were burned at the stake and they, they sang songs and hymns and and all of these people that gave up their families and their lives to just go out there, and they suffered a tremendous amount. Now, it's, you look at the Christians today, and it's, a, it's amazing to me how much we think we're suffering, you know? And we think we're really suffering as Christians. But now, let me tell you something. The Christians back in the 1400s and 1500s and 1600s who were literally dying they were suffering. 
They were sacrificing and they were serving. And then let me just conclude with saying that uh, not only did, did the Lord sacrifice and, and he, he, uh, he served and he suffered, but he also forgave. In Colossians 3.13, forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against you, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. How many people in this room right now have, can say, you know what, uh, that I have an unforgiving spirit about me. There's just something in my life I'm just hanging on to. Somebody did me wrong, and you know what, I just can't forgive them. I, I bet there's a lot of people in this church, I bet there's a lot of people in the church as a whole, the universal church, that will say, I just have an unforgiving spirit right now. But you know what? If you, right here in 1 John 2, 6, he that saith he abideth in him, ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. If you say you abide in Christ, then you need to do what Christ did, right? What would Jesus do? He forgave, he suffered, he sacrificed, and he served. So this is a great way to kind of introduce the, uh, the new section. We look at uh, a new life in Christ, part two. Uh, first of all, let's look at an old commandment emphasized. There's an old commandment emphasized. And John has been instructing the believer how to behave. Now, can I say this, that, that this just doesn't come naturally. Uh, a, a Christian needs, we need help, don't we? We need help. People have said uh, for years in certain, uh, certain uh, uh, I guess, sects of Christianity, they, they say that when, when you are saved, you will serve. They say that when you are, when you become a Christ, or when you become a Christ, when you become God, <laughs> when you become a Christian, you will become like Christ. And uh, can I just say that that's not true? Why? The, you know, the vast majority of the New Testament is written to get us in line with Christ, to get us to behave like him. So John now is teaching the Christian how to behave as a believer. How is it we're supposed to behave? And I think we need this in the church. I think we need to be instructed how to behave. I think we need, we need help with this. We need instruction. So John, and that's what, and that's what John is doing. And uh, I'm reminded of, uh, of, of Josh McDowell, and I've mentioned him before with, in context, saying that he had said, rules without a relationship lead to rebellion. So not only do I think that we need to be taught how to behave, we need to be taught uh, why it is we are to behave as Christians, Right? It, it, this isn't just blanket, just do this because I said it. This is, this is what God said. This is why he said it. This is how we can be conformed to his likeness, right? Rules need a context. So 1 John chapter 2, verse 7, it says, Brethren, brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which he had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard from the beginning. Now, the commandment here is, is nothing new. He, he's, he's not writing a new commandment. This is actually uh, an old commandment. The, the, the new commandment was given by Jesus back in John 13, 34, where he said this, a new commandment I give unto you. That's where it happened. A new commandment I give unto you. Ready? Watch this. That ye love one another. Now, that's powerful. This is the new commandment, he says, John 13, 34. That ye love one another as I have loved you, so ye also love one another. This is the new commandment. That's a powerful commandment. This is, uh, this is contrary to the world, isn't it? So oftentimes we, we, just, we, we have uh, an unforgiving spirit. We have a hateful spirit. We have a bitter spirit. We have a resentful spirit. I mean, all of these negative things. And, and, and I'll tell you, we're missing this in the church. And if a, a Christian is supposed to act like Christ, verse 6, then they ought to do this one thing that Christ said is a new commandment, which is to love one another. So then to walk as Christ walked was to love as Christ loved. And we miss this component. As a Christian, we, 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 we literally we, we hop over the love and we, we move right on to other things that aren't as meaningful. But if you want to be like Christ, you've got to love like him. The commandment was old in that sense. It was given to the church early in John 13. But there's no new content. 
It's really that simple. Isn't that funny? <laughs> Sometimes the simplest things are the most profound. I've, I've said that. The simplest things are the most profound. Love one another. You don't need to interpret it. Love is so important. This is a reminder to us. It's amazing how oftentimes we forget this simple thing. I mean, here it is. John, he pens the Gospel of John. He's inspired to quote Jesus' words, right? Inspired to write this down. We get to 1 John chapter 2, and we see him repeating himself again. Never, ever, ever, ever stop remembering those easy things. Never stop remembering the simple truth from God's word. It's the most profound oftentimes. Now, the Christians, the Christians owe God an upright life. God had died on behalf of the Christians. Now, the Christians owe it to God, in a sense, to behave like Christians ought to behave. He bought us, remember this. He bought us. He paid for us. We owe a debt to him. And we ought to owe this debt, and it ought to be an upright Christian life. John 15, 12 said, This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. How many times does God have to say something before we actually get it? Isn't it amazing? Like, it almost seems redundant. I mean, you look through 1 John, and it is scattered with love and, 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 uh, and obedience and things of that nature. I mean, it's, it's amazing how many times he has said this. In 1 John 3, 23, and this is his commandment. Watch this. That we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and guess what? And love one another as he gave us commandment. You know, it's amazing within a marriage, you just, you just want someone to love you, don't you? And in a family, you just want someone. Love is, love is one of those uh, four-letter words that are just so wonderful, powerful. You know, it's funny when you see a young couple, and uh, I'm not even sure the, the words they exchange before they exchange, I love you, I've been married so long now that I don't even know. But I, I, I can vaguely remember just not saying anything and thinking, I, I, I like you a lot to the point of love, but I can't say that. Because if I say that, I mean, we're going to get married. This is just all there is to it, right? I mean, don't you just want someone to say, I love you? I mean, you all feel good like when you, get, like, when you hang up the phone with your, with your spouse. Do, do, you guys, do you guys say, I love you? I say, I mean, honestly, I say I love you every single time. It'll be like, hey, can you bring the ketchup? Yeah, love you, bye. Click. It's almost automatic. I just called to say I love you. No, I don't, I don't sing that to her. I don't sing it. I don't even know. That's probably a terrible song. I have no idea. Either. I was moved with the unction of the Spirit of God to sing that. See, that's not true. I don't know why I said that either. I don't, the, the word, the powerful. Love is powerful. Love Love changes things, doesn't it? No greater love has any man than this. The greatness of love is defined by laying down your life for someone, and Jesus laid his life down for us. And he says, so you ought to lay your lives down for the brethren. No greater thing, no greater love. So the commandments to love one another summarize all the commandments of the Lord. Isn't that neat? And this old commandment is nothing more than what was spoken years ago by Jesus. But there is a new commandment. There is a new commandment, 1 John 2, 8. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past. And the true light now shineth. So some people say, well, there, there's a contradiction. See, he says, he says uh, uh, there is no new commandment. Then he says, a new commandment I write unto you. There, there is an old commandment. 
There is an old commandment in John 13, which was a new commandment at that time. Now, to John's readers, this is a new commandment. It, it, it amazes me. Unfortunately, uh, m- many people have not heard of this new commandment to love one another. I think in some cases, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's really identified in the Christian life, isn't it? Like, you go out and love, it's just new. It's new in the sense that it's new to some people. To love one another is a new concept, isn't it? Second John 1 5, and I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning. That we love one another. This is, in a sense, a new commandment. It's a new commandment for Christians. Listen, follow this. You love people. You love people. Nothing speaks more volumes than love. Let me say this just quickly in conclusion. John 13, 34 and 35, write a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Verse 35, by this, watch this, this is powerful. By this, all men know that ye are my disciples. If you have love one for another. This is how we let our light shine. This is how people know that that right there is a Christian. He's a disciple of God. He's following the Lord. If you have love one to another. When we love as Christ commanded, we literally manifest God's love to other people. People then see Christ through us. We become the ambassadors we become the spokesperson. We, we become the person. Remember, Jesus says, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he was here, he was the light of the world. When he removed himself, he says, ye are the light of the world. This is how people can see a Christian. They can say, man, this guy right here, this kid, he loves God. He loves God. And he loves people. Zane Hodges says, when the Christian carries out the command to love after the model of the Savior's love, the truth that is thereby manifested is nothing less than a manifestation of the spiritual reality of the age to come. People see Christ through us. And so it's amazing when you you look around and you say, man, this, this, this world is just destitute. And there, there, there is, there, this, this is, it's a horrible, we're in a horrible state. You know what's interesting? People say, where is God in all of this? Where is God in all of this? Where was God when this happened? Or where was God when that happened? Well, where was the Christian showing forth the love of God? That's where God was. He's working in us. The Holy Spirit indwells us. And we are moved by that Holy Spirit to love one another. And so when people ask, where is God in all this? You can just look at yourself and say, where where was God in all this? Where was I? We are the light of the world. And people know that we are disciples if we have love one to another. Friends, there's nothing more powerful than love. I'm not going to sing the song. <laughs> but sometimes people just need to know that they're loved. And sometimes those words, they just are like icebreakers, aren't they? Just like an icebreaker. You ever put your arm around somebody and be like, brother, I love you. Man, it's just as like, it's the nicest thing you can say to somebody. God loves you. Man, I love you. It's commandment. It's an old commandment. Jesus taught this, but it's a new commandment to us Christians that we ought not to forget. Never forget to love one another. And uh, we've got a bunch of people on Zoom. I can't see their faces. (laughs) But they need to love one another. And they need to be in church. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) Hopefully they heard that. I can see kind of Samuel over there at the corner. I thought he was going to be in church tonight. Samuel, where are you? I can't hear you. He's just nodding. He's just nodding like this. Anyway, 